Hello, hello. Welcome to the PGish Podcast. I'm Erin with your parental guidance to help you grow yourself as a parent and raise healthy, happy, and successful humans. Hey friend, in case you missed it, you still have time to sign up for my Weary to Revive five-week class. This class can be taken on your own time, whenever, or you can join me and other Burnt Out Mamas when we kick off on Monday, February 27th, with community calls for five consecutive Saturdays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, starting March 4th. Together, we'll create a blueprint to feel, heal, and redefine joy and life on your own terms. This class will support you in rediscovering yourself and your values, and making better decisions that are in line with those values. Find better ways to be productive and efficient, have more fun, and ultimately feel revived, empowered, and excited to be a woman and a mom again. To learn more and to sign up, head to pgishparenting.com backslash events. Speaking of burnout, you're stuck with me today to discuss this nearly three-year-old question about returning back to the office. As you likely know, It's been nearly three years since I had to race out the door at 7.15 a.m. with my hair curled, makeup perfected, and in business attire, with two kiddos in tow, with full bellies of breakfast, and backpacks filled to the brim. Nearly three years since the world shut down, and what so many thought was impossible, that of working from home and being productive, has forever changed the landscape of the working world. However, ever since the two weeks to flatten the curve, Turned into a month, to six, to a year, to two years, the ultimate question has been, when will we go back to the office? As a single mom, let me tell you, I am beyond tired of this question. And we'll just ignore the point in time when I wasn't allowed in the office when we first reopened and was threatened to be terminated. Cool? Cool. Anyway, this past month, my work calendar has blown up with social events industry conferences and networking dinners, business development coffee dates and walks, happy hours, you name it. I don't typically mind these events and actually welcome them because yes, I do enjoy leaving my house, looking up from a screen, and connecting in person. Yet the struggle was when my routine and flexibility that I've known for nearly three years from working from home was stripped from me. I realized that for years prior to the pandemic, I'd missed out on taking care of myself and spending time with my kiddos, all in the name of a commute and paycheck. Don't get me wrong, I am grateful for these things and my team, but the sacrifices that were made to show up to an office wasn't worth it. This is a tale as old as time, and no, I'm not talking about the love finally found between Belle and the Beast. I'm talking about how women continue to juggle their careers and career advancements, motherhood, equal pay, mental health, physical health, and home life. I think about this often as a single parent. I'm certainly no superwoman, there's simply no one else here to carry the load. And that village that it takes to raise your kiddos is fairly non-existent as well. And as most moms would attest, we juggle a lot regardless, as we see and feel differently than dads, or so I truly believe. But when you're single, it's a different story. You just step up and do it all because you have to. But I digress. The last couple weeks of working crazy hours and driving every which way brought on so much stress, I was reminded that it's easy to acclimate, throw up your hands, and surrender, that this is just how life is supposed to be, and to suck it up. Yet, I don't think we should cave that easily, because I don't think that that's what we should be doing or how we should be living. During this two-week period, I didn't make time to work out. You might think, no big deal. But to me, it is. I know I don't talk about it a lot, but when I don't work out or move my body in the morning, which I like to do first thing and I like to lift heavy weights, I'm just all out of sorts and I'm grumpy. That in addition to no sleep, I mean, you tackle on those two things and I am just a hot mess. You know, during this period, I was going to these events during the day and then would come home at night and attend to emails and deadlines to catch up on and... It was just a lot. And maybe I'm an anomaly. But once sleep and physical exercise is thrown to the wayside, I tend to make poor decisions, like eating unhealthily or having an extra glass of wine or losing all motivation to do the things that I love to do, which is just crazy. At this point, 
because I don't feel my best, I berate myself and usually snap at my kids because they're just right there in my way. Then the mom guilt and the shame set in for all the things, and the vicious cycle continues. Sounds super healthy and effective, right? Yet most of the time, no one questions these unhealthy patterns. It's just assumed that it comes with the territory of being a working mom. But don't just take it from me. It has been proven that not getting enough rest has a negative impact on your health and physical well-being. Sleep deprivation can cause you to eat more, eat crap, and throw your hormones out of whack, which is particularly important for women, keeping them in alignment, not out of whack. It's really no surprise that getting a good night's sleep promotes a healthy balance of hormones, including those that regulate appetite, digestion, and metabolism. This also begets the the what-the-hell effect, which I'm not making this up, this is a legit thing, wherein you inevitably self-sabotage because you've let yourself slide a little. So, you know, you might as well go all in. This is typically associated to dieting, in which you may have cheated on your diet by eating, you know, a bite of cake or something, and then shame sets in, or maybe your taste buds convince you to eat the whole damn cake, because what the hell, you already screwed up. See what I mean? We self-sabotage, we acclimate to these poor environments, despite not wanting to, or little by little, we just let things slide until we realize we lost all control and are in the pit of despair. Now, I do not like to be all doom and gloom like this, yet the irony is not lost on me that as my mind stirred these last couple of weeks as to how and why our society sets us up to be sick and tired, as well as setting working women up to fail, or so it seems, I came across two articles that both confirmed my reality, which is very sad. Now, I had a visceral reaction to simply reading the title of Time Magazine's article, As People Return to Offices, It's Back to Misery for America's Working Moms. Yeah, that's a fun one, isn't it? (laughs) Overall, there were many valid points made, and I actually appreciated this article. For example, I've never truly quantified the time I've saved from being able to work from home. To be honest, it makes me too sad to remember the soul-sucking countless hours I spent on BART commuting into San Francisco back in the day, prior to COVID. Yet this article did a little math for me. The author states, without the burden of a commute, we did our jobs, took care of our kids, and sometimes even got to exercise. Remote work meant the difference between chaos and sanity. One recent study found that it saved people on average 72 minutes a day. Now, I love the math she did. I love having that 72 minutes back in my day. But that difference between chaos and sanity, 100%, I agree. I'm sure you're right there with me and you still have chaotic days, but not having to worry about if the train would be on time or break down or if I'd miss the train and then be late picking up my kids from daycare where I'd be charged by the minute is definitely a freedom I embrace. Actually, I embrace all of the flexibility that has come since being remote. I feel more in control of my own schedule and also feel like more people can relate to the precarious balance that is being a parent. In the before times, before the pandemic, I felt I had to hide that I had kids, even though my boss and coworkers knew I had them. I felt like I was living a double life. You know, one where I had to be strictly a working woman, and one where I was strictly a mom at home. You know, in fact, when I started working after having kids, I'm pretty sure I cried every day for the first month because, one, I despised having to leave my kids at school and daycare for 11 hours a day, and two, feeling pressure to stay late despite anxiously eyeing every minute on the clock knowing I was utterly dependent upon public transportation, and a boss who rarely got me necessary information on time to complete deadlines. And I won't mention, but I will mention that he had a wife at home whom he could rely upon to take care of his three kids. And I had no one. There is so much relief in not having to live those days anymore. Yet my mind still shifts between work and kids whenever I am working. It's hard to do your job well when your brain is like a pinball, constantly bouncing from the deadline at hand to school pickup or business development networking to a text from your child who's making dinner at home alone for the first time. How does one be both the employee they want to be as well as a calm and cool parent? And this is where I believe men and women diverge. This is where both expect to make compromises, sure, as a parent, yet women are expected to make more. 
blame it on society or our different brain structures. Either way, women simply tend to be juggling more, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Okay, but what about getting people back into the office? I understand the push to get people back. There are many variables at play, of course, you know, aside from personality traits and just different home life circumstances, but here are a few. We need each other. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree that we need community and to be isolated at home is not healthy. And personally, I think with having kids and neighbors whom I enjoy and community elsewhere, I don't feel isolated, nor the need to see my coworkers in the office every day. And sure, there are hybrid situations, but if we were to be forced back into the office five days a week, community would not be my first desire. And while I say that, I can also be completely honest that gathering at this three-day conference a couple weeks ago was truly refreshing. Talking to new and old colleagues face-to-face outside of a screen is life-giving. I also likely stayed out way too late simply because it was novel. But I also think that this is what social lives are for outside of work. Now, what about collaboration? Yes, it is awesome and better in person. Valid point. Personally, for what I do, collaboration can be happening over the screen or not. I do a lot of solo work and it's completely accessible from home. So again, this just depends on your situation. However, I'd like to say that I recently went on a BD walk with several industry women, which was lovely. We managed to walk and talk, not only about business, but about our lives in the sunshine, sipping on our favorite beverages. Hands down, this was the best BD event I've ever been to. This is how business should be conducted. You don't always need four walls and an address to build relationships and collaborate. And then what about simply the physical office space? Now, this one is tricky because I'm in an industry that relies upon the built environment and building more offices. I understand the vacancy rates and the economy tied to it. And I don't have a good answer to that because you simply can't snap your fingers and convert that space for other tenants. So I will definitely leave that to the technical team to figure that out. But I do understand that this is an issue. But what I do know is that whether we're in the office or still remote, we get our work done. In fact, most Americans overwork. The other article I read was from Fast Company titled Six Red Flags, Your Body is Breaking Down from Overwork. And I will link these articles in the show notes if you want to read them yourself. But this particular article painted a picture that people who work long hours override their physical discomfort in the name of productivity. It noted that people who work more than 54 hours per week were putting themselves at grave risk with three quarters of a million people dying from coronary heart disease and stroke. That's fun. I will save the conversation about the 40-hour work week for another day, but death by overwork, as it's called, doesn't happen overnight, of course. You know, we see this all the time, just little by little, we give away our control. We slowly walk away from our values or our healthy routines and even our joy, assuming we can get back to them after the deadline or the work event or the busy quarter. Inevitably, we don't. And over the years, our habits and health tank. We find ourselves stuck wondering how we got here in this miserable place. My friend, this is not good. We talk a lot about mental health. Heck, for the last two years, my company spent a lot of time and money talking about mental health, talking about taking vacations, talking about becoming a B Corp and getting just certified and having equal pay and equal division of labor across the board. Not so much at home. That's, you know, a conversation for you at home, but it should be a conversation that you're having, yet I'm not seeing a lot of action. Now, I didn't Google, because I don't really want to know, but I didn't Google how little vacation Americans take, but I know it's bad. We're workaholics. We say we care about mental health. We advocate for vacations like an actual unplugged vacation, yet who's taking them? I'm beginning to think we're all talking no action. When will we actually do something about it? When will the conversation change? We say our leaders and CEOs need to lead the way. Now, I don't know about your bosses, but my bosses are emailing me at 11 p.m., 4 a.m. on the weekends and while at the beach on vacation. This isn't helping the situation. And business is business, but 
I value my health and my family way more than the next business deal. And I do believe that the stakes are high right now for working moms in particular. And I think we need to ask ourselves what our options are and what are the best solutions before we follow the masses. Anxiety is high. It has been for the last several years. And we should first find a sense of calm before we do anything that may not be beneficial in the long run. I may not know exactly where to start, but I do think more women and possibly their spouses and partners should speak up for their health and their family life. Again, I realize not everyone thinks this way. There are different variables at play. There's extroverts and introverts. There's poor family life at home and poor home life environments. But for those of us that do, we should have a voice. I'm not so ready to lead that movement, but I will. So anyone who's with me, let me know. I would truly love to know your thoughts on this because I don't think I'm alone. And I think we have a lot to say on the issue of returning to the office, but people just aren't speaking up. So please do email me at hello at pgishparenting.com or DM me on Instagram at pgishparenting. And with that, I'm not going to keep you from your work any longer. So here's to a productive yet enjoyable and balanced week. See you next time.